Welcome to Freedom Church Online, raising up a body of spirit-filled believers to shake our city, region, and the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Follow and subscribe to stay connected and never miss a transformative moment. Now let's get into today's message. We're going to believe for the Lord to show up in our midst. I mean, kind of easy when you walk in and he's waiting for you. So much easier to believe for things when you don't really have to wait. He's just waiting. I promise you, if you ever feel like you're waiting on God, he's already been waiting on you much longer than you've waited on him. So if you feel like it's taking a while, be patient. Because remember, he's eternal. So he's literally been waiting since before time began for this moment right now. And so if you've been waiting for an eternity for this moment, just imagine how much more joy the Father and Jesus and the Spirit have to be here in this place right now. <clears throat> Before we begin, I want to give honor and reverence to you, Father God. I thank you that you are seated upon the thrones of heaven, never moved, never shaken, never surprised. I want to give reverence and honor to you, my Lord Jesus Christ. For you are never moved, you're never shaken, and you're never surprised. I want to give honor and reverence to you, Holy Spirit, because you are never moved, you are never shaken, and you are never surprised. And yet consistently, God, you always move and shake everything around us and everything inside of us. This morning I pray that we would be moved and shaken and we would be taken from whatever place we're in right up to your table that we may feast with you that we may taste and see that you are good in the name of Jesus amen so 1 Corinthians 10 21 the Apostle Paul writing the words of the Holy Spirit says this he says you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. There's two tables in front of you right now. There's the Lord's table and there's the table of the world, the table of demons, the table of brokenness. I personally, I'm gonna, spoiler alert for the ends, I'm gonna encourage you to fast from the table of the world and the table of demons. And I'm going to encourage you to feast on the table of the Lord. But see, the table is a consistent metaphor throughout all of scripture for us. The table is always the place of covenant and the place of intimacy. From Genesis to Revelation, time and time again, we see the table. We see gathering at the table. We see intimacy at the table. We see covenant at the table. And I'm just going to tell you straight up, right now, one of the greatest attacks on the church worldwide is attack on covenant. The enemy does not want us to be people of covenant. He doesn't want us to demonstrate our covenant with God. He doesn't want us to demonstrate our covenant with husbands and wives. He doesn't want us to demonstrate our covenant with holiness and righteous living. He doesn't want you to be a person of covenant, a person who keeps their word and demonstrates this is what covenant looks like. But I'll tell you, the number one thing that the world is looking for out of the church, covenant keepers. The world is not shocked by covenant breakers. I mean, just look at any politician. They make promise after promise after promise, and they get elected, and three days later, they've broken them all. We see people that say all sorts of things, and they break their promise. They break their vow. They break their covenant. We are used to covenant breakers. It should not be that way in the house of the Lord because we have a covenant-keeping God. 
I ask you, has the Lord ever failed to keep his covenant? Spoiler alert, no. And if you're confused on that, let me tell you, the answer is no. Look from Genesis to Revelation. Everything that he says he will do, he will do. Everything he promises, he fulfills. And even though there are some things that we're still waiting for, like when he said, I am coming back soon, we know, because we know his character is that of a covenant-keeping God, that he's coming back soon. But we see this image of the table. And see, the table is something we need to understand. We need, we need, to, we need to know. We need to be comfortable seated at the Lord's table. In Genesis chapter 14, we see the story of Abraham and Melchizedek. Uh, I'm just going to tell you my personal view of Scripture is that Melchizedek is literally a pre-incarnation of Jesus Christ appearing to make covenant with Abraham. You know, there's some debate on that. You know, different people have different views, and that's okay. But I'm going to tell you that the covenant that he makes and institutes, that's the covenant kind of covenant that God makes. And see, in Hebrews, we're told that Jesus is our high priest in the order of Melchizedek. And so we know that even if he's not, Melchizedek. This is the kind of covenant he makes with us. And it says this in, uh, I'll start in verse 17, or excuse me, verse 18 of Genesis chapter 14. It says, And Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought out the bread and the wine. He was the priest of God most high. And he blessed him, and he said, Blessed be Abram by God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hands. And Abram gave a tenth of everything. Right there, we see the table. Abraham is waiting. You know, he's, in, he's in the midst of this battle. And all of a sudden, Melchizedek just shows up on the scene and busts out a table of bread and wine and says, hey, let's make covenant with God right here, right now. If Abraham can do that in the midst of war, we can too. A lot of times we think, we have to wait until, you know, until I get all these things in order. All my ducks are in a row. Look, I don't have ducks. They're not in a row. I don't know where they are. I'm, what I have is I have a God who keeps covenant. And I have a promise that I can trust him. But see, Abraham, he didn't just like have this happen once and then move on. This became something he understood because then later in Genesis uh, chapter 18, he sees the three men that were angels that appeared. And this time, he doesn't wait for them to bring the table. He runs out and says, hey, guys, 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 give me a minute. I'm going to set up a table right here under this tree. We will eat. He didn't wait and say, okay, well, if these guys are really from God, they'll come. Because the last time, you know, he came and he made the table for me, you know, so I'm just going to wait here and hope that something happens. If you are waiting for the table to appear, build your table. Learn to carry your table with you. Because everywhere you are, you're a walking covenant. Is Christ in you? Is he the hope of glory? Has he made covenant with you? Did he say, I make covenant with you, but you may only approach me on Sunday morning at this time. If you approach me at Sunday at 9.58 a.m., I'm sorry, you're too early. No. He says, all that I am is yours. All that I have is yours. Call unto me and I will answer you. And I will show you the great many things that you didn't know and couldn't learn on your own. Jeremiah 33.3 says, you are a walking table of covenant with God. Abraham learned that lesson, so he sets up this table. And in Genesis 18, I, you know, for time's sake, I'm not going to read every, every verse of it. But I'd encourage you to go back. 
more blessing gets poured out on Abraham. Abraham, like, this dude, this dude was just walking, and everywhere he'd go, somebody wanted to bless him. I, I would like that anointing. Like, Abraham's in the middle of a battle. Melchizedek shows up. Blessed are you. Abraham's at home taking a nap. The Lord shows up and cuts covenant with him and changes his name and blesses him and says, oh, and by the way, I'm going to be your exceedingly great reward. What better reward is there than Abraham himself receiving God as covenant? <coughs> then he's sitting out in the field and sees these guys under a tree. More blessing. He runs in around kings, all the kings of the world. Hey, can we bless you? Hey, can we bless you? Who's this dude? He's just some, some guy that moved into this land after his father died, and he's like, it's not even his land. He doesn't have an inheritance there. He's never been there. He just shows up one day, and all of a sudden, every king in the land's like, I know that you're coming to live on my land, but let me bless you and give you everything you need. I want that. I have that. Everything that the Lord has need for you to have, he has given. That's why the scripture says that every good and perfect gift has come down from the Father of lights. The Bible says we have been given everything that we need for life and godliness. It's the table of the Lord. And see, the table rarely ever comes in a pretty way. I mean, occasionally, you know, you might, we might set up for communion and have the table there like that and be a ceremony. But more often than not, the table comes in the midst of calamity. The table comes in the midst of brokenness. The table comes when you're at your last moment thinking, I don't even know how I'm going to make it. And you probably could have made it earlier if you'd taken the time to set up your table an hour ago. But, you know, last minute, that's how most of us get things done. Because, see, we get this scripture, and it's in Psalm uh, 23. You all know that one. You know, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in the green pastures. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of his goodness for his name's sake. And then you get down to the end of that whole chapter, and he says this. He prepares a table for me in the midst of... Where's your table? Your table's more often than not in the midst of your enemies. That place that you don't want to go, those people that you don't want to see, that thing that your heart is dreading to do because, well, they hate me. They don't like me. I, you know, they don't understand me. It's probably where your table is. You know? Uh, if you'd have told me a few years ago that we'd be setting up a table every, every Saturday... <laughs> And meeting downtown with all of the broken people that have needs, I would have said, that's not my table. No, my table is to sit with kings and eat with royalty. And I, I've done that. But the Lord said, but your table's there. See, David and Jonathan were best friends. So much so that but when Jonathan knew David was about to become king, he literally said, I want you to make covenant with me that you will bless me and my family. And literally, like, it's the kind of covenant that makes, makes most, most guys uncomfortable. He said, I want you to put your hand right here on my thigh and bless my future generations. Like, if you say that to most guys, we're like, you want me to do what now? <laughs> like, can't I just bless you from here? But David had so much love for Jonathan and so much faith in him. They were brothers. And he said, I got you, fam. Let's do this. And he makes covenant. And it wasn't Jonathan's fault that the nurse didn't understand. The nurse was just acting like the people of the world. But if they'd understood the covenant that David had with Jonathan, Mephibosheth would have had no fear. So this one guy, Ziba, he says, well, you know, king, 
There is one guy left in that whole family line. His name is Mephibosheth. He probably pronounced it better than we do because, you know, it probably wasn't hard for him. They said, they explained, you know, he's a cripple, he's this, he's that, and he's whatever. And David said, find me this dude. Bring him in here. Bring him to my table, and he is going to eat at my table forever. Forever. He didn't say, bring him here, I'm going to feed him for the night, give him a, you know, a, a hot meal and a place to sleep and then send him on his way. He didn't even say, I'm going to take care of him for a few years and then set him up. He didn't even say, I'm going to bless him as long as I'm alive. David's belief in covenant is said, he will eat at my table forever. That means when David died and Solomon became king, if Mephibosheth is still alive, Mephibosheth still has a seat at the table. Imagine if we were such covenant-keeping people that the covenants we made were not reliant on us being there to enforce them. What if the covenant that you made that I'm going to bless so-and-so, it didn't matter if they betrayed you, it didn't matter if they offended you, it didn't matter if they, they did all manner of evil to you, I said I'm going to bless you, and there ain't nothing you can do to stop it. Come on, Mephibosheth. I'll give you a hint. Use this all, Mephibosheth. Because every one of you was broken by the curse of sin before you even had a chance to understand what was going on. And then, even after you understood what was going on, you still made poor choices and you just heaped on more crippled to yourself because you just continued to sin and live like the world. But then, one day, there was a king who understood covenant. The great king in the line of David, who sits on David's throne forever. And he said, I don't care that you're crippled. I'm going to clean you up. I'm going to bring you to my table. And you will eat forever. So when we eat at the table of the Lord, it's not just like, Oh, well, you have an invitation on Sunday mornings. You can come and sit at my table. It's not even like, you know, for a while. No, you're invited to the table forever. And there's the expectation that you're going to show up every night for dinner with the Lord. Hebrew people understand this in a, in a way that a lot of us don't, um, you know, I don't know if you're familiar, but every fall there is a Hebrew feast called Tabernacles. That's what that's what. It, and some of your uh, Bible translations it might say booths or shelters or tabernacles. But it's this feast where they literally in in their yard they build a tent and they set up a table and they set up a place to stay and for eight days. They live out of this tent. They eat all of their meals at this table. And the covenant understanding was when we come together for tabernacles, God meets us in this place at this table. Now, I'm assuming more than likely when they sat down at the table, Jesus didn't physically walk into the table with them every year. But they understood by covenant, it doesn't matter if I see him. It doesn't matter if I hear him. It doesn't matter if he speaks to me. This is his table, and he has invited me to eat here with him. So I'm going to be here. It just so happens that, that the Feast of Tabernacles is coming up in like two weeks on the, on the Hebrew calendar. And they understand. Why don't we understand that? We, we, we don't have to wait for the Feast of Tabernacles for God to be with us. Right? He dwells inside of us. His spirit is on the inside, giving us life, preparing a table for us. And yet we do not come every day with the expectation that I am dining with Christ today. My Lord is right here. He's going to minister to me. He's going to encourage me. He's going to speak to me. He's going to correct me. He's going to do everything that I have need of today at this table. 
You're going to go out to lunch after church. Jesus is going to be at your table. You're going to go home. You're going to wake up in the middle of the night. You're going to get a cup of water. Jesus is at the table. You're going to get up in the morning. Jesus is at the table. You're going to come to church. Jesus is at the table. You're going to go to work. Jesus is at the table. You're going to be in the presence of your enemies, which may be at work. You're going to see Jesus is at the table. From Genesis to Revelation, we see covenant poured out at a table. And it's a very intimate place. Because coming to the table requires a vulnerability. You know, Mephibosheth was crippled. By the law of the king, he wasn't even allowed inside the city, let alone the palace, let alone the king's dining hall, let alone the king's table. When, when they came and got him and said, King David wants to see you. What do you think he was thinking? Do you think he was thinking, I'm finally going to get my inheritance? Because I am the son of Jonathan, the grandson of Saul, and it's about time. Do you think he walked in to David's palace, or I guess, you know, carried in, since he was crippled and couldn't walk, and went, yo, Uncle David, what took you so long? No. He went in knowing I'm broken, I'm undeserving, I have no business being here. He's probably going to kill me because, you know, my nurse told me that when the new king takes over, they kill anyone that could rise up. He came with fear and trembling to the table of the king and found out that he had an invitation not to die, not to be ridiculed, not to be mocked and ostracized for his brokenness, but to sit at the table and feast. We have the invitation to sit at the table. We have the invitation to feast. We have the invitation to taste and see that the Lord is good. We have that invitation every single day. But at the same time, the world is out there with a megaphone saying, come check out our table. We have all this. And I don't know what particular thing is your thing, but the world has it. And the world is willing to give it to you as often as you want it, as long as you promise to eat at their table. Problem is, their table is a temporary table. At most, the table of the world is available to you as long as there's breath in your lungs. But the moment you die, that table's gone. The moment you die, you have no access to them anymore. And in reality, the very same demons that run that table, like we read in 1 Corinthians, they're going to come and collect. Because they're going to tell you, I know you feasted at my table for the last 30 years. It's time to pay the bill. Jesus isn't like that. King David never went to Mephibosheth and said, so uh, I noticed you had six egg rolls tonight. You know, that's going to be uh, an extra dollar fifty, right? Oh, and you know, we, we charge extra for sauces. Jesus isn't McDonald's. King David's not McDonald's. They don't charge extra for extra sauces. He says, all that I have is yours. And if there's nothing on this table that you want to feast on right now, let me see your heart's desire, and I will have my finest chefs make it and bring it out for you. Could you imagine having access to the finest chefs in the world, being willing to make anything you want at any time, and then you're like, hey, what's that dude outside with the uh, table full of McDonald's and Milky Ways? You know what, guys? I'm going to go over here today. I mean, could you imagine, like, you have access to 
the, the best Mexican food in the world, and then you, you end up at Taco Bell? <laughs> like, in the kingdom, you were not destined to eat at Taco Bell. Now, if you like real Taco Bell, I'm, 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 not, I'm not mad at you. you. You do you. But there is a difference between what you get at Taco Bell and what you get when you're with Abuelita and she's making fresh tacos and fresh guacamole and all that. There's a love and a tenderness. There's a quality of ingredients. There's a blessing in it. And more than that, when you eat it at Taco Bell, ain't nobody talking to you. Ain't nobody care about you. They're just, give us your money, eat your food, go away. And they might not say it, but go, go to a fast food restaurant. That is the attitude they have. But when, when, when you get to sit at Abuelita's table, she's going to feed you. If you eat everything on the plate, she's going to fix you another plate because clearly you're still hungry. If, if you uh, finish that, there's probably a third table plate coming for you. And the whole time she's going to talk your ear off. She's going to tell you all about her life and her day and what's going on. She's going to ask you all about yours. She's going to ask you all those questions. How come, how come this? How come that? Well, what about this? Have you thought about that? Have you done this? Have you done that? And you're literally, you're going to feel that family. How much more so do we get that when we sit at the table of the Father? The Father who knows everything. Who, When you sit down at the table, he says, So, uh, I noticed the other day, you kind of smelled a little like pride. What were you doing? Why, why, why'd you put on that fragrance when I have the fragrance of the Lord to put on you? Oh, I noticed the other day you were, you were, you were snacking on some sin. Why, why were you snacking on sin when you could taste and see that I'm good? Oh, hey, I saw you had the bottle filled with the wine of the world. And you were getting just all kinds of turned up. Have you not come to my table and tried my cup that is my covenant of blood for you? And he doesn't say it like, you horrible person, you. What kind of an ungrateful jerk are you that I have prepared this table and you're out there? No, he's like, haven't you learned it yet? Haven't you figured it out? go to that table you have a fleeting moment of joy and then you have endless brokenness endless heartache endless depression endless everything you don't want but just a nibble and a morsel off my table will satisfy you more than anything you've ever eaten remember that Samaritan woman she understood this she meets Jesus, and, and she's like, oh, can I have some of, your, some of your, your, your blessing? He goes, why would I give it to dogs? And she goes, you know, even the dogs get the scraps off the table. The scraps that fall off of Jesus' table are far better than the finest feast that the world has to offer. And, and, and if all I'd ever get to be was the Lord's lap dog waiting for that little morsel to slide off the table, that would still be a more satisfying eternity than the finest feast of all that this world could offer. The beautiful thing about it was Jesus wasn't actually calling her a dog, didn't think she was a dog. Jesus was trying to draw something out of her. Hunger. What table are you hungry for? Are you hungry to sit at the Lord's table? Are you in the midst of your enemies and willing to be like, hold up. We can resume the battle in five minutes. I'm on break. Here's my bread. Here's my wine. Hold on. No, no. I, I, I know you're still mad. I, I hear you cussing me out. That's okay. This is bread and wine time. This is table time. 
and Jesus gets table time and you, you can wait. What if we lived our lives like that? We don't. By and large, that guy starts cussing us out. Either we get mad and start cussing back, or we, you know, bow up and get ready to start a fight, or, you know, we shrink back and get depressed and get upset and our whole day is shot. How can your day be shot because some dude was stupid? When you have a king right there with a feast for you. Maybe we need to be the kind of prophetic people that when we're about to like lose it, whether it's anger, depression, mental breakdown, whatever, maybe we need to be the kind of prophetic people that literally just say, hold on, I need to sit at my table for a minute. I don't know. What if, what if you actually integrated that into your life? It'd look weird to, to your enemies, you know? Your boss is cussing you out because, you know, you screwed up a job and you're like, hold on. Let me get out my cup. Let me get out my bread. We'll resume this after I've had my cup and my bread. Because I promise you, after you've renewed your covenant and reminded yourself of the goodness and the faithfulness of God, anything your enemies are throwing at you, it ain't going to phase you the same way. I mean, I, look, it's still, it's still going to be an enemy. It's still going to be frustrating. It's still going to be problematic. But when we train ourselves to learn that the goodness of God is with me everywhere I go, and I have access to his table at any point in time, and I don't have to wait, I don't have to worry, I can just feast on his goodness, Ooh, how sweet it is. His table is always there. Abraham knew it. Mephibosheth knew it. Jesus laid out for his disciples, you know, like Pastor B taught two weeks ago on the table of communion out of 1 Corinthians. But uh, I'm going to just quick read from Luke. He said, it says this in Luke 22, starting verse 14. It says, when the hour had come, he reclined at the table. He reclined at the table. Jesus is about to face the biggest enemy of his earthly life. The cross. Reclining at the table. Like, it ain't even like he's sitting there and he's feasting like an inmate about to have their last meal before they die. No, he's just chilling, hanging with his best friends, eating a meal, celebrating the goodness of God. It says, and when the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat the Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. He took the cup, and when he gave thanks, he said, Take this and divide it amongst yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God has come. And then he took the bread, and when he gave thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, This is my body which was given for you. Do it and remember me. And likewise, the cup. After they'd eaten, he said, this is the cup that was poured out for you. It's the new covenant in my blood. They're celebrating Passover. If you've never celebrated Passover, of all the Jewish celebrations, it's like the most hyped and exciting. They're singing, they're laughing, they're dancing. There's games for the children. And everybody's just leaning up at the table. It's, it's about as lit of a party as you're going to find among holy people. It's everything and then some. And this is what Jesus was doing the night before he was to become the Passover lamb sacrificed for us. He wasn't sitting there going, all right, guys, i got to warn you. Just a few hours. Keep, he wasn't checking his watch going, hey, you know, they're, they're about to come. They're about to take me. It's about to get bad. You need to... Uh, you need to make sure you have your food rations ready because once they know that you're with me, you're not going to be able to get anything. You know, get in your storm shelter, be ready to hide. No. He wasn't, he wasn't prepping them for some sort of massive apocalypse. He was partying. He's like, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. 
And I, I, I use that verse specifically because at the end of the Passover, as you leave, you sing that psalm. This is the day. You know, when we sing it, we, we get it twisted. We sing it about every day. You know, you wake up in the morning. This is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made. <laughs> and every day was made by God because there's nothing that was made that wasn't made. But that verse is talking about a specific day. This day. When Jesus celebrated with his best friends knowing he was about to die. Knowing in less than 24 hours, every ounce of blood that I have will be spilt on that ground. And every ounce of brokenness that you've had will be paid for. And he holds up the cup. And he holds up the bread. And he says, when you do this, when you eat this bread and you drink this cup, remember me. The last thing before he could be crucified, he sat at the table. Jesus demonstrated so many things for us. But one of the greatest lessons that we could learn from him is that when all the world is coming to kill you, to crush you, to break you down, you already have a seat at the table. And Christ is right there with you. And however bad you think the crushing that the world wants to put on you is, they crushed him worse. However beaten down you think you are, however broken you think you are, he was worse. Like, look, they can, they, they can do all manner of things to you. We, we, we've turned this phrase, they're crucifying me, into like a catchphrase. If you still look like a man... You ain't been through nothing yet. Because Isaiah said they beat him so badly he didn't even look like a man anymore. And yet, knowing that was about to happen, knowing that he really wasn't, like, eager for it, because when he's in the garden, he said, if it's possible, take this cup off my table. He's still celebrating. He is still rejoicing in the goodness of God. We, we ain't seen nothing yet. And yet every last little dart, every last little mosquito of the enemy, and we get all up in a, <laughs> the enemy. <laughs> it's a mosquito. Like, like, it, it's not going to kill you. Just swat it and move on. Why do, why do we make the enemy's table out to be so much bigger, so much better, so much brighter, so much more glorious? Why do we feel like we're missing out? Because, oh, well, I didn't get to go and feast with all them people down there doing that thing. Look at those people. They're not good and filled, and blessed, and happy. They're using the table as a crutch because every time they're empty, they got to run back to the table. But Jesus repeatedly says, hey, if you drink of this water, you will never thirst again. Hey, you have a seat here eternally. Everything that I am is yours. Everything that I have is yours. Feel free. Feast on me. And when he said to eat of his flesh and drink of his blood, like, that's a glorious invitation, but it scared everyone off. And he literally looks at his disciples after thousands of people have just fled the scene. And he goes, y'all about to dip too? <laughs> and Peter, in one of his few shining moments, where he didn't open his mouth and say something dumb on the first try, <laughs> goes, where else is there to go? You're the only one that has life. You know, P Peter, Peter had a habit of saying the wrong thing the first time often. But at least Peter knew where to eat. 
at least Peter knew where to eat. He feasted on that table. But see, this table is not just a momentary table. Remember how we said, you'll eat at my table forever? There is literally coming a day. There is coming a day when you will physically sit at that table. Because the table is not just a current blessing, but it's an eternal reward. In Revelation 19, it talks about the table and it says, Blessed are those who have been invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. So all of this life is pointing us to a table where God himself says, about to marry my bride and we're going to feast together and I like just last week I was in Montana at a wedding I was one of the groomsmen it was awkward I had to wear fancy clothes uh, but everything was all set up beautifully and at the very front of the reception hall there was a table and not everybody got to sit at that table the groom sat his bride sat, and the friends of the bride and the groom who were chosen sat. You know, some of us, some of us get to be the bride of Christ and sit and he's at his table and feast with him. But you know, there's still a blessing for those that are the friends of the bridegroom. Jesus talked about his disciples and he said, you guys are the friends of the bridegroom. Like there was a special blessing and a friendship for them feast and there was a seat for them at the table so while the rest of the world is spinning on towards the fiery pits of death hell and the grave we are being invited to a table we're tasting of the table now but we're going to live in this table for eternity some of you though some of you might not have eaten at the table in a while. Like, let's face it, we're all really good at wandering from the table. You know, the old, the old hymn used to say, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave this God I love. Take my heart, Lord, and seal it for thy courts above. Like, every one of us is really good about getting drawn back into our flesh. And if, if you don't think you are, just ask the person who knows you the best. They will give you the stories. <laughs> And so oftentimes we don't eat as often as his t at his table as we should. So then we get Revelation 3, the Laodicean church. Remember them? They're the ones that he said, I really wish that you were hot or cold, yes or no. But in reality, you kind of lukewarm, and I am about to vomit you out my mouth. Like, you, have you ever eaten something that just, it was so vile that just the taste of it on the tip of your tongue, and you're like, throwing it out. Can't, nope, can't do that. Mm -mm, gone. Mm. That's how you are when you're lukewarm before Jesus. But you know what he says to the church at Laodicea? And I, I want to remind you, he says this to the church. He wasn't talking to the world. He wasn't talking to unbelievers. He was talking to the people that had been saved, that have been in the church, that have tasted and seen that the Lord is good. He says, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. And if you open it up, I'm about to come in and sup with you. I want to sup with Jesus. Amen. I want to sit at that table and feast on the goodness and the glory of God from now in through eternity. I want to be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. I don't want to be one of the spectators sitting down, clapping when the bride and groom cut the cake. I don't want to be the DJ who gets to do the cool music and then goes home. I don't want to be the janitor that just has to clean up everybody's mess. I want to be right there at the head table. I want to be seated inches from Christ, sharing in the marriage supper of the Lamb. 
just side note, lamb is delicious. I am eager to taste of it when we sit at his table. Because what he has to offer is going to taste so much greater and so much better than anything we've ever tasted of. So some of you in this room right now, you've tasted of the table of the Lord. You've partaken of it. But then you kind of got a little busy and distracted and ADHD squirrel saw the table over here and decides you're going to come over and eat a little bit of this. You were walking by and you saw some cupcakes and thought that looked like a good little snack. And it might have been weeks, months, years since you've come back to the place of covenant. But there's an invitation in this house right now to come to the table. We never in this house withhold the table from the people of God. We have communion there and we have communion there every single Sunday. And I watch and I see some of you when you first walk in, you come right in that door and you grab one. You take it to your seat and then at whatever point the spirit moves on you, you crack that open and you remind yourself of his body and of his blood. The other week we had it laid out on the tables here and we... We celebrate it as a family. We partake of the table together, you know. But the table's more than just doing communion. The table is the intimacy of the covenant with our God. The table is the ability to rest and recline in his presence, knowing that he's with us, that he's for us, and that he's moving on our behalf. The table is the invitation that says, hey, you don't have to eat over there anymore. You don't have to go to that place. I have all the food you could ever want, free and clear. And when you finish that table, and you've eaten all the, the, that's on your plate, my angels will come with a fresh plate. And it, that next plate is going to taste better than the one before. Because every time you feast on his goodness, you see something new about him that you didn't know before. When you get to that place of brokenness, you know, like Pastor Brandon shares his testimony of how he, he'd been on every kind of drug you can imagine, and he'd done all these things, and then one day he tasted of the table of the Lord. And on that day, he tasted of mercy and redemption. When he comes to the table today, he remembers mercy and redemption, but he gets to taste of goodness. He gets a taste of favor. The Lord has infinite attributes. Mercy, grace, justice, sovereignty, power, might, justice, righteousness, holiness. And that's just the ones I can rattle off off the top of my head. Time would fail me to list off all of his attributes. And yet you have the invitation every time you come and dine with him to be introduced to a new attribute. Or to be reminded of an attribute that you haven't tasted in a while. So this morning as we close, uh, I'm going to ask for Dwayne and for our ministry team people to come up. And I'm going to have you guys on this side. And we're going we're gonna to close with an opportunity to come to the table of the Lord. Whether you want to come by taking communion or whether you just want to come and kneel down at the altar. If you need prayer... If you need someone to, to carry you to the table because you feel like Mephibosheth, looking around the room. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure I can lift up every single one of you. Not all at the same time, but one at a time. And so if, 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 if you feel like I'm so broken, I don't even know if I can walk into the table. That's why we have the ministry team, because they are strong in the Lord and the power of his might. And they will lift you up before his throne so that you can taste and see that he's good. Don't ever, ever think that you are so broken that you can't come to the table. Because that's, how, that's not how life works. That's not how community works. Community says that when you're broken and you need someone to lift you up, we're going to pick you up, Mephibosheth. Community says when you're so lame that you can't, you, you can't even get there, we're going to cut a hole in the roof and lower you down so that you can be at the feet of the master. Community says, I want you at my table with me. 
You know, selfishness says, I want my seat at the table. Covenant says, I want all of our seats at the table. I don't want to get to the table and not see you there. So some of you this morning need a little extra prayer. Our ministry team is going to be here. Some of you, you might just want to remind yourself of his attributes. There's communion there and there's communion back there. Some of you just might want to lay out before his table and recline. There's plenty of altar space. I have good news for you. In this house, the altars are always open. They've never been closed, not once. So whatever you have need of, ministry team, Dwayne, if you guys want to come, you are blessed to be invited to the table of the Lord. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to close us in prayer. If you need ministry, if you need time at the feet of Jesus, if you need the, the, to come to the table and taste of his goodness, do it. If you don't, you're free to leave. You're free to do whatever you want. But we have plenty of space out there to fellowship and to talk. People who are coming up to the altar, we want to bless them and honor them and honor what God's doing in them by making this a place where they're not distracted, where they can just encounter their covenant-keeping God. So if you want to go, you're welcome to go that way. I'm going to close us out with a word of prayer. Father God, I thank you that you are a covenant-keeping God. I thank you that your word says that Jesus Christ was the lamb slain before the foundations of the world. And that means that you set up the table for me before I even existed. You set up a seat for me at your table forever before I even knew who you were. Your word says that while I was your enemy, Christ died for me and reserved my seat and welcomed me in. Father, how could we ever be satisfied at the table of the world, drinking the wine of the world and the cup of the devils? Lord, I pray for each and every person that's in here under the sound of my voice and everybody that's listening online or watching, whether it's now or some future point in eternity. Lord, I pray that each one of us would be reminded of the covenant-keeping God that you are that we would see our invitation to the table, that we would find our seat, that we would taste and see that you are good. And Lord, if we're broken and we're in need of assistance, Lord, I pray that you would tenderize each of our hearts to recognize the people around us who need us to carry them to the table, who need a shoulder to lean on while they limp and crawl and find their, their selves at the table. Lord, we are all Mephibosheth. And yet you have given us a seat forever and commanded us to feast. I bless the people in this house as we go. Lord, let your face shine upon them. Let your glory go with them. Let your presence overwhelm them and overtake them. And be in the midst of their situations every day so that they would taste and see, even in the presence of their enemies, that you have set up their table name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you for being a part of Freedom Church Online. Don't forget to follow, subscribe, and tune in for the next episode.